Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You may find a seat and fill it. But thanks for being here. Great to have everyone. Special welcome to our first time guests. I know we have uh, several of you here today beginning the campaign. You were invited by a friend. So you are our special guest. Hope you enjoy the morning and the series that we are beginning today. When I was uh, growing up, uh, one of our Christmas traditions with our family, and it actually continued even when we were grown and we'd go back and we were married and then we had kids. We maintained this tradition, and it was the tradition that we were going to complete a puzzle during the holidays. Now, my parents would go out and they would buy a challenging puzzle. None of this 12 piece, 20 piece, no, 1,000 piece. And none of these easy pictures. No, no. They would always find, you know, like about a 100,000 piece puzzle and, and hard, hard picture to put together. Now, the rule was we would take the box, we'd dump it on a card table, and at any time, anyone could come and work on the puzzle a little bit until their eyes got fuzzy, and then they would leave and go eat, and then they'd come back and do a little more puzzle. Now, anybody could do it, everybody participated, but there was one unwritten rule with the family tradition. Before the last family member drove out of the driveway to go home, the puzzle had to be completed. That was just an unwritten rule. It had to be completed. I'm telling you, the last day or two is 1 o'clock in the morning, and, you know, we're putting the puzzle together because we know we've got to get the puzzle together because something is just wrong with an unfinished puzzle. Now, I am more convinced today than ever before that God has a specific purpose or a task for each of us to accomplish between now and our funeral. And I, I call it our life mission or our life purpose. However, I realize sometimes finding a, a person's life mission is not easy. It, it, it's like that puzzle. Sometimes putting together the, the puzzle of your life mission can be very difficult and very, very frustrating. I mean, at times, you know, you kind of think, okay, if my life mission is like a puzzle, I think a few pieces of the puzzle fell on the floor and like the dog ate them. Um, I'm really having, I got gaps in my puzzle here. Well, welcome to week one of living your dash. Now, the, the dash I'm referring to is the dash on your gravestone. You know, the dash between your date of birth and your date of death. Now, the, uh, the Grace Sunday night team, they came, up, they came up with a great idea. They said, you know, to begin the campaign, we want to, uh, to highlight the beginning of a person's life. And so we, we want a picture of a baby. And so they asked me, said, Rick, do you know, uh, do you know anybody who... Um, who has recently had a, a really cute baby, maybe a little cute girl, or, um, or now do, it could be a grandbaby. Well, I, um, I thought and I thought and I thought, and then three seconds later, I thought of the perfect grandbaby and a girl. Um, now, I think the Grace team was thinking like maybe an eight by 10, that we could maybe display down front. I don't. I felt like the. I felt like a eight by ten might be a little small. It'd be hard for people in the back. So I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll make it a little bigger than um, a little bigger than an eight by ten of my beautiful granddaughter. My my beautiful granddaughter. This is uh, Marie uh, Mara Grace. Mara Grace Coon, uh, born to my daughter and. Son-in-law. Now, I want you to know Mary and I are not prejudiced or proud. But have you ever seen anything so beautiful in your life? Is that too cute? I'm thinking. 
kind of thinking. Let's see. Let get the that camera angle. That's pretty good right there. So, so here. Yeah, I know, I know. She deserves applause. Oh, by the way, Mary, uh, happy, happy Valentine's Day. This is your Valentine's gift. Um, Mary's going, I'm a, I want the wallpaper size. Um, the dash, where was I? The dash. The dash represents your life from the day you were born till the day you die. Now, here's the challenge that we are all going to face in this series. You cannot go all the way back and start over. You can't go back and start over. However, what you can do, wherever you are, think of birth here and death down there, wherever you are in the journey, you have today and perhaps tomorrow and perhaps more time. How are you going to live from today to the day you die? That's what this series is all about. How will you live the rest of your dash? What is your life mission? Our goal in this series is to get real practical and to literally give you what I believe is a biblical step-by-step -step plan to help you get from here to there and the there is discovering and living out your life mission. Now, when you ask a man, you know, what, what is your life purpose? When, when you ask a guy by the name of Nehemiah that question, he will say, my life mission is to build a wall. To build a wall. The year is 444 B.C., Nehemiah is living in Persia. He is a Jew displaced in Persia. He uh, has a great job. He serves as the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes. Now, the job of a cupbearer is to taste the wine to make sure it's not poison. Most days, that's a great job. <laughs> Most days. he discovers that um, something is bad back home in Jerusalem. You see, Jerusalem had been destroyed about 142 years earlier by the Babylonians. Now, in that gap of time, some of the Jews had returned back to Jerusalem to re-inhabit the land. However, Nehemiah learns that the inhabitants of Jerusalem are in great distress. One of the main problems is there is no wall around the city of Jerusalem to protect them from their enemies. The book of Nehemiah tells the story of this man and his quest to travel back to Jerusalem and to build a wall of protection around Jerusalem. However, you must understand that the book of Nehemiah is more than just a construction story. In fact, Nehemiah is a story of a man finding and fulfilling his God-given, God-ordained life mission. All right, now let's talk about us. Where do we start in the process? Where do we start in finding our life purpose? Well, I want to encourage us to start where Nehemiah starts. We must first catch God's vision. We must be able, all of us, without exception, we need to be able to answer this question. God, what do you want to accomplish using me between now and my funeral? There's the question we want to answer in the next six weeks. Or at least begin to start answering that question. All right? What does it take to catch God's vision? Let's dig into our study. You ready? Here's number one. If you're going to catch God's vision, number one, engage your heart. Number one, engage your heart. Let's begin reading Nehemiah chapter one, verse one. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, 
while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant uh, that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Can you hear the emotion in that man's voice? How about you? What, what is it that touches your heart, that stirs your emotion, that moves you to tears? What is it? For, for Nehemiah, he cares deeply about these Jewish exiles in distress because of a broken down wall. How about you? What, what do you care about? I mean, really care about what just distresses you. Now, see, what distresses you may be the first indicator of God's life mission for the rest of your life. See, you can usually spot what you care about deeply because here's the way it works. You know, when you see something or you hear about something and it just... It starts stirring inside of you. You ever had that emotion? And you see that and you say, you know, that, that's wrong. That somebody, somebody has got to do something. That can't go on. That, that problem must be fixed. You ever have those emotions? That could be the early indicator of what God has put in your heart, a passion he has put in your heart to maybe start meeting that particular need. Now, here's one thing it took me a long time to understand about life purpose. We don't all care about the same causes. Have you learned that? We don't. I would get so frustrated at times in my life because, man, something would move me and there was a cause and I was, man, let's, I was going to fix that. And I'd say, hey, everybody, there's a problem. There's a need. Come on, follow me. And I'd get a little ways and I'd go, Come on, follow me. And nobody was following. And I thought, those people don't love Jesus. <laughs> because if they loved Jesus, they would care about that need as much as I cared about. It took me a long time to realize we don't all care about the same causes. And, and you got to understand that or you'll get very frustrated. It does not mean that other people are evil or don't care. They are just not as passionate about the cause that moves you. Does that make sense? See, what causes you to lose sleep can cause another person to yawn. That's just the way life is. Now, there's a good reason why, why you are passionate about a certain cause. And here it is. Let's get this in our notes. It has to do with wiring. God has wired you with a specific passion. Now, if we all had the same passion, how many causes in the world would be addressed? One. We would all be stepping on top of each other trying to meet a particular need. So God has uniquely wired us with a passion, with a care about different needs. I mean, here at Grace, there are so many people who serve faithfully in so many different areas, from, from prison ministry to divorce care, to grief share, reflections and recovery. Now, you know that list I just gave you right there? Guess how many of those ministries I am involved in? None. None. I'm not involved in any of them. But the people who are involved in leading those ministries, guess what they have? A burning passion. They saw a need, and they're willing to pour their lives into that. Uh, Teresa's video on Operation Christmas Child. What great example of God touched her heart, put a passion in her heart for Operation Christmas Child, 
Can we all agree that Operation Christmas Child is a great success at Grace Community Church? Oh my goodness, not only do we respond, but now we're a regional collection center. Every year we get this big truck out here. This year we had to pack the truck. They could barely close the door and they were pushing stuff up on top of the boxes. What does that say? Somebody has a passion for Operation Christmas Child. Do you know what I do with Operation Christmas Child? I go to the luncheon. <laughs> I go to the luncheon. Teresa will tell you, I go every year. I never miss, well, I never miss many meals, but I never miss the Operation Christmas Child luncheon. And then secondly, my wife and I will pack, we'll, we'll pack a few shoe boxes. That's all I do. What? Rick, don't you love Jesus? Don't you love needy children around the world? Absolutely. That's why I stay out of the way of Teresa. <laughs> so she can get the job done. See how that works? We all have different needs. Now, here, here's what I've learned. And, and sometimes, guys, this may happen to you. Probably because I'm a pastor, it happens to me a lot. People will regularly approach me with a real passion about a worthy cause. However, I know something is wrong when it comes out like this. Hey, Rick, there is a serious need and somebody ought to do something about it. And then they just look at me. Now, I know what the translation is. Rick, we think you ought to take care of this need. Now, you guys know, don't you, you don't get away with doing that with me. You come to me with a need, I say, great idea, you're in charge. You're the team leader, put together a team, meet that need. Why, why do we have to do that? You cannot meet every need, but together, working in our unique passions, we can cover, look at this, we can cover a lot of needs in our community and even around the world. So, the... Let's get back to the puzzle. The first piece of the puzzle in catching God's vision, you, gotta, you have to discover what engages your heart. See, don't get involved in something that doesn't engage your heart. You'll fizzle, you'll burn because you don't have a passion. Find something that you're passionate about and start moving in that direction, all right? Engage your heart. Number two, engage your head. Point number two Engage your head. I want you to notice what happens. Here, Nehemiah just been deeply moved when he hears about this need, but notice, I want you to watch how it moves from his heart to his head. Watch this, verse 5. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you we have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. That would be Jerusalem. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was the cupbearer to the king. Notice, what does Nehemiah do? 
What does Nehemiah do once he sees the need and engages his heart? He next engages his mind in prayer. Notice how it moves from a feeling to an active prayer of his mind. Um, let's write this in our notes. His object of care becomes the object of prayer. Now that needs to happen in our lives. The, the object of your care needs to become the object of your prayer. Now, how are we as believers to be genuinely transformed? Well, we all know this. In our fall campaign, we did a whole series on being transformed. Do you remember the guiding memory verse of that whole series? Romans 12, 2. Let me jog your memory. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, notice, Nehemiah, he is at a point in his life, he wants to do God's will. He wants to know and do God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. How is that going to happen? He has to have his mind renewed. He's got to have the truth of what God wants him to do in his mind. So what does he do? He engages his mind in prayer. By the way, as I read the, the great prayer of Nehemiah in Nehemiah 1, did anybody notice, wow, he really thought through his prayer. I mean, he was praying specifically, and, and you could tell this wasn't just kind of like a, Oh, God, good morning. I really don't know what I'm praying about, but just bless me, bless me, bless me. Did you notice it was a well-thought-out prayer of his mind? I noticed a phrase in there. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed. This was much more than just a compassionate feeling on the part of Nehemiah. No, no, this was a concern, a deep concern that engaged his mind in prayer day after day after day. Now, big question. We got to get this. Let's write this down. What happens if we engage our hearts, but we don't engage our heads? Usually nothing. Usually nothing. I mean, we feel bad about the problem or the injustice or the need. However, we don't prayerfully think about a solution. Nehemiah does more than just feel distressed uh, uh, about the Jewish exiles living in a wall of city. No, no, he engages his mind. He prayerfully begins to seek a solution to the problem. How do we know that? End of his prayer. What does he say? God, grant me success in front of the king. The second piece of the puzzle in, in catching God's vision for your life purpose, the second piece is engage your head. All right, you engage your heart, you engage your head. Step three, engage your hands. Engage your hands. Somebody is going to have to get their hands dirty. It's a broken down wall. Somebody's got to get their hands dirty. Who's it going to be? Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Let me read you the whole story. It's fascinating. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, Nehemiah says. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? <laughs> this is the king asking his cupbearer, hey, what do you need, buddy? 
Just name it. What, what do you want? Uh, now watch Nehemiah's response. Back on the screen, back on the screen. Then I prayed to the God of heaven. Boy, you ever do those little shotgun prayers? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked him, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, this is like, man, I'm on a roll. You know, when you're on a roll, keep going. If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And while I'm at it, may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple, uh, by the temple and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was with me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanballat, okay, now when I say Sanballat, everybody's got a boo. He's, he's the bad dude. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah, when I say Tobiah, you also have to boo. Bad guy. And Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this. They were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. And we're going to leave the enemies right there. They'll pop up later in our story. Nehemiah, he may have been praying, but I'm telling you guys, he was praying with one eye open. He is patiently waiting and watching for God to open a door of opportunity. And I got to tell you, when that door opens, can we all agree? Nehemiah is ready with a plan in hand. Nehemiah, Nehemiah immediately makes himself available to God and then to the king. Now here is the amazing part of this first section of the story. In your notes, I love this. By the end of the conversation between Nehemiah and the king, by the end of the conversation, Nehemiah has the king's permission to go, provision for the journey, and protection all the way. Can you imagine? How about that? None of this would have happened if Nehemiah had said to the king, you know, king, there's a problem over in Jerusalem. Somebody needs to go there and build a wall. Now, don't look at me. I got a job. I like sipping Merlot every day. I like my job. But somebody needs to go. What do you think the king would have said? Get out of my presence. Don't try to give me your passion, okay? God's put it on your heart, obviously. You go take care of it. The wall is going to be built, ladies and gentlemen, because one man was willing to engage his hands. He was willing to get his hands dirty. I put a quote from Albert Einstein in your notes. Albert Einstein said, the world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. You see, this is the third puzzle piece in catching God's vision. You got to be willing to engage your hands. There's a principle that we're going to be following all the way through our study. I want to introduce it to you this morning. Uh, so we'll get it in our notes, but more than that, we'll get it in our heads. And here's the principle in your notes. Most of us don't plan to fail. We just fail to plan. We just fail to plan. 
Now, Nehemiah is able to catch God's vision for his life purpose because he has a plan to succeed. And I want you to see this morning, his plan was, was to, first of all, to engage his heart and then engage his mind in prayer and then engage his hands, a willingness to get involved and get dirty. So, do you have a plan to catch God's vision for your dash? Don't know how much dash is left, but is there something God, maybe even now, is kind of planted in there and it's beginning to stir. There's a need you're aware of. You have the time, talent, and treasure to meet that need. Maybe God even today is beginning to stir that. Well, kind of fan that flame over the next six weeks and see what God does with it. I read a great story recently about the actress Reese Witherspoon. Great actress. Uh, Reese Witherspoon won the Best Actress Academy Award back in 2006 for her role as June Carter Cash in the movie Walk the Line. Powerful movie. And she deserved the Academy Award for winning, uh, playing June Carter Cash. The, the evening where she accepted her award, a very emotional acceptance speech, she said that people would often ask June Carter uh, how she was, how things were going, and June Carter would always say, I'm just trying to matter. I'm just trying to matter. This was June Carter's way of saying she wanted to live a good life that made a difference in at least someone's life. God is still looking for people like Nehemiah, like June Carter, who are just trying to matter. Every day they wake up and say, God, today, I just want to matter. I want to matter in my marriage. I want to matter with my kids and my grandkids. I want to matter at work. God, I want to matter at church. I want to matter in my community. God, if you'll give me the grace, I'm willing to matter in the world. If you will use me. Are you interested in being such a person? If so, you can learn in the weeks ahead how it can happen in your life. Learning from Nehemiah how to find and fulfill God's unique purpose for you. And believe me, it all begins when we catch God's vision. Let's pray. God, thank you for the incredible willingness of Nehemiah to engage his heart, his head, and his hands in doing a great work for you. Father, I pray that this week you would stir within each one of us a passion for something, something worthy of us, Lord, to do with the rest of our lives. Forgive us, Lord, when we, uh, when we give up, when we think, God, you could never use somebody like me. I'm, I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too busy, I'm bored. I don't have these gifts, I don't have those talents. God, we know that you have uniquely called each one of us to be a part of your kingdom. So I pray, God, that you would use each one of us. But God, first, before we run out and start building a wall, help us, Lord, to catch your vision for our lives. This is our prayer through Christ. Amen.